Since behavioral psychologists started dinking around with the human mind in the 1970s, we've learned a lot about our own human nature. We've learned that we're hypersocial individualists, that we trend toward monogamous breeding groups, except when we don't, that we're naturally kind to each other when we're not being instinctively suspicious, and that we're the best rational thinkers on the planet, a skill we mostly use for self-delusion. Glad that's all sorted out. As a whole, these traits have made us the dominant organism on the planet. But as individual people, they can lead us to see things that aren't there, to believe in things that don't exist, and to do bafflingly idiotic things like, I don't know, robbing a couple of banks using only lemon juice to hide your face from the security cameras. With a setup like that, you gotta figure I'm talking about a true story. And you're right. This story is not just notable because of its rock-chewing levels of stupidity, but also because it inspired researchers to find out why ignorance makes you confident and expertise brings doubt. Those researchers were David Dunning and Justin Kruger. Their study gave us the Dunning-Kruger effect and a ticket to see the view from the top of Mount Stupid. Lemon Guy's name was MacArthur Wheeler. He'd hit a rough patch in January of 1995, and he did what anyone might do in his situation. As the saying goes, when life gives you lemons, rub them on your face and rob a bank. Someone out there told Wheeler that putting lemon juice on your face will make you harder to identify on camera. Wikipedia says that Wheeler thought lemon juice might work because it can be used as an invisible ink. They're right about lemon juice, but not about Wheeler. Yes, lemon juice can be used as an invisible ink. I've linked a handy how-to in the description if you want to try it, but Wheeler never mentioned it. Neither did Dunning or Kruger in their study. Nor does the New York Post article cited by Wikipedia as the source for this claim. So it seems to be just one of those things that got added to the story as it was passed around. This is just a guess, but I think whoever told him to use lemons was just trying to see if he could get his idiot friend to squeeze a cocktail lemon in his eye one night at the bar. He probably didn't realize that Wheeler was seriously asking for advice about how to rob a bank. We do know that Wheeler wasn't completely convinced, and he decided to try it out before the main event. He squeezed a lemon onto his face, and half blind and sputtering, he took a Polaroid of himself. Imagine his sublime relief when he looked at the picture and he, quote, wasn't anywhere to be seen. Either the camera malfunctioned, the film was bad, or he simply, you know, missed. Probably because it's hard to take a selfie with a big-ass Polaroid camera, especially when you're a 300-pound, 5'6 guy with acid in your eyes. However this went down, all we know is he was like, good enough, and was soon off to rob not one, but two banks, confident that he could hide from the cameras with his new lemonade. By the time the bank alarm rang and the police arrived, Wheeler and his accomplice had peeled out of there and managed to squeeze past the authorities. Wheeler spent the next few months thinking that he got away with it, until in April, the police played the surveillance video on the nightly news and he was arrested within an hour. When the police showed him the surveillance video footage, which clearly displayed his face in all its zesty best, all he could say was, but I wore the juice. And now, on top of his felony convictions, he's the poster boy for daring incompetence. No wonder he's got such a sour look on his face. Yeah, I'm done. MacArthur Wheeler's story is the one that Dunning and Kruger used to introduce their findings from their study. A study which gave us the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is one of nearly 200 cognitive biases that we've discovered thus far. These things are everywhere. When you accept flimsy evidence that supports your own opinion while attacking well-sourced facts that disagree with you, that's confirmation bias. The tendency to like something just because you're familiar with it, think of things like brand loyalty, that's exposure bias. Cognitive biases like these are ways that we convince ourselves that something is true or real when it isn't. And our brains are really, really good at doing this. At a basic level, the Dunning-Kruger effect is the tendency for unskilled people to think that they're significantly better than average at a given task. Although, there's more to it than just that. To get their findings, Dunning and Kruger gathered up a few hundred undergrads at Cornell University and gave them a series of tests. After completing each task, subjects were then asked how they thought they did compared to everyone else. That last part is kind of the essential thing, compared to everyone else. The theory was that those who did worst on the tests would also be the worst at assessing their own abilities. And Dunning and Kruger turned out to be right. The worst performers on these tasks often put themselves in the 55th to 65th percentile, even though they scored in the 13th percentile. That means that 9 out of 10 other people did better than they did on that given test, but they thought they were at the very least in the top 5. What did surprise Dunning and Kruger a bit is that the top performers also consistently misjudged their place in the pack. 
they actually underestimated their own performance relative to their peers. The best performers on a skill often put themselves in the mid 70th percentile, even though their scores were often in the 80th to 90th percent. The thinking is that underperformers overestimate themselves, while overachievers overestimate everyone else. Subsequent studies have backed up these conclusions, but the takeaway here is that the least competent members of a group for any given task will still think that they're just as good as everyone except the very best in the group. Worse, they aren't competent enough to recognize what competence is. This means that they can't learn by watching other people's successes and failures. So while they might not think that they're better than everyone, just most people, how would they possibly identify that more skilled minority when they meet them? And even though they're constantly running into reasons to reassess their own abilities, they don't know that. If I assume that between me and anyone that I meet, I'm the more competent person, and I never have a reason to change my mind, whether or not that I believe somewhere out there someone might do it better than me doesn't count for shit. I'll just constantly be thinking that it's lucky for all these dopes that I'm here to help. With that, it's probably time we talk about Mount Stupid. Mount Stupid is a term that's grown up around Dunning-Kruger as it's discussed more broadly. It was born when Zach Weinersmith of the Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial webcomic made a graph that I imagine charted his experience on social media. This little sweet spot right here, he lovingly dubbed Mount Stupid. This graph here is a good example of one that you'd find in an article about the Dunning-Kruger effect. This particular graphic is right off of Wikipedia. And there's Mount Stupid standing tall and proud. In this case, the axes are confidence a person has in their own abilities and their actual ability. On either end are the famous extremes of the Dunning-Kruger effect. On one side, the wise experts who humbly concede that there are those far better than they. And on the other side is team, how hard can it be? These are the people who are sure they can climb a mountain because they take a daily walk and their neighborhood is kind of hilly. They are certain that they can do it because in their mind, they already have. They're sitting at the top of Mount Stupid right now, enjoying the view. Which all makes a certain kind of sense, but we need to talk about this. Mount Stupid isn't really the best name for it. Dunning and Kruger weren't modeling intelligence, they were modeling competence, skill level. It's just that Mount Overestimation is harder to say than Mount Stupid, and less satisfying for those who have to clean up the messes of confident novices day after day. This graph tells a nice story. Humbling failures take you from Mount Stupid into Don't Quit Your Day Job Valley, followed by the slow acquisition of cautious competence. It fits our anecdotal experience, and if you look up the Dunning-Kruger effect, you'll see this graph a lot. The big problem with this graph is that well, it doesn't fit the data, like at all. It's a graph that doesn't so much explain the Dunning-Kruger effect as it is explained by the Dunning-Kruger effect, in that it's widely and confidently passed around because it seems right, even though it's not. Which got me thinking, what if Mount Stupid doesn't exist at all? Dunning and Kruger get to the end of their paper with one major unanswered question. How do our most incompetent people get through life without learning how unskilled they truly are? Or to put it far better than I can, they were impressed by, quote, the failure of learning which has left their capacity for fantastic self-centered delusions so utterly unaffected by a lifelong history of educative events. There are some possible explanations for why an undergraduate student at an Ivy League school would do poorly on an English grammar test. But again, we aren't talking about what they thought their results would be, we're talking about how they thought their results would compare to everyone else. So why in the crazy how did the same student do poorly on that grammar test while thinking they were in the top third of their class? Dunning and Kruger give us three reasons. As Dunning and Kruger point out, even the smallest child knows if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. We don't give each other negative social feedback. We agree to disagree. We think other people's opinions are sacrosanct. Heck, even the average GPA in US high schools right now is a 3.0, or a B average. Which, I know they changed it, but that used to stand for above average. Those academic and social opportunities to have our deficiencies identified by other people are probably our best bet for learning and self-improvement. But, for whatever reason, we severely limit them. In fact, it's kind of considered impolite to engage, depending on how you do it. Dunning and Kruger also point out that failure is confusing. If you succeed at a thing, it's usually easier to point to why. Dogged hard work, a monumental change you've made in yourself, a big dose of luck, whatever. But failure is a dirty little sneak. Bad timing, impatience, giving up too soon, incompetence, or worse, 
As Picard says in the most depressing line from all of Star Trek, it is possible to commit no mistakes and still fail. Which means we have a laundry list of things to blame any given failure on. If we're trying to make ourselves feel better, we could probably find something to blame that wasn't our fault. And even in those cases where we're genuinely trying to improve ourselves, it might take another four failures before you finally identify just what it is you need to fix. And finally, the reason that's most backed up by the data in their study, our most incompetent have an inability to learn from others. As I mentioned earlier, the truly incompetent are so unskilled that they don't recognize competence when they see it. They can watch an expert make a decision and gain no insight into how that decision was made or why to then apply to their own process. And they probably won't even realize they're watching an expert in the first place. The problem is, none of these things explain Mount Stupid. They absolutely explain unwarranted and stubborn overconfidence, but for something to be a mountain, it has to have a slope on both sides. And none of these reasons give us a way off Mount Stupid. The only thing Dunning and Kruger found that made people more able to recognize their own incompetence was making them more competent, literally training them in the skill in question. But while training allowed those formerly unskilled people to understand their previous mistakes, it doesn't seem to have made them less confident. In fact, they often became more confident, just less wrong in that confidence. If we look at that popular graph of the Dunning-Kruger effect again, this whole middle part doesn't exist. According to the data, the people who have the most accurate view of their own abilities are those folks who perform around the 70th percentile, meaning they're solidly above average. You know, just like everyone thinks they are from the start. It turns out we all start at the same place, confident of ourselves and swaggering around without any knowledge to back it up. I just described every teenager and now you know why. As we learn more, our confidence doesn't really go down. It just increases more slowly than our skill does, until eventually we stop being wrong about how skilled we are at a given thing. Our skill level catches up to and eventually eclipses how good we think we are compared to everyone else. It's just that some people never improve their skill at all. Every few weeks, I stick my face into an unfamiliar topic, write a script, and then turn around to tell a bunch of folks all about it. Makes this kind of a scary topic for me. Because, let's face it, if the Dunning-Kruger effect were a lion, I'm basically a fat, three-legged gazelle with a cold. Like any novice, I'm confident in what I'm saying, but really, how would I know if I'm wrong? But after digging into this topic, I still have a couple of questions. First off, is there any better way to talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect? And secondly, it's obvious we can't make everyone competent in everything, so how can we fight this aspect of our own nature? To that first question, it seems that mentioning Dunning-Kruger has become kind of a fancy shorthand to call someone else stupid. Don't get me wrong, people definitely do stupid things, and dealing with the consequences of those stupid things is extremely frustrating. But pointing out a mistake is different than attacking the person, and using something as a shared expression of frustration can easily turn it into a bandage for our own insecurities or a way to put other people down. If that happens, it's all the harder to share the more interesting implications of that original thing. I'm not saying there's no value in cathartic venting, it's just that Dunning-Kruger explains a lot about our world at the moment, and that knowledge is far more valuable than a catchy name for a thing that sucks. As far as the second question goes, and making that thing suck less, follow-up research indicates that those worst performers are also the people least likely to seek self-improvement or to accept criticism. In an interview with Forbes magazine, Dunning called it expedient escape, the quickest route to invalidating a critique or to shifting blame for a failure. The people who most overestimate their skills are the same ones who are the most reluctant to acknowledge their shortcomings. And because failure is complicated, they usually have an easy out. And because we're polite, we usually let them take it. I don't think we're doing anyone a favor when we make it easier for someone to ignore the reality of their own mistakes. I'm just not sure that as a society, we really know how to point out those mistakes without starting a fight. And I'm damn sure we're not good at accepting that kind of feedback. Somewhere along the line, we started to equate failure with being a bad person. And I'm curious if the most confident incompetents among us are so sure of themselves, not just because they don't know enough to see that they're wrong, but because they need to be right. There's a saying, confidence is quiet, insecurity is loud. Maybe those most resistant to acknowledging their failures do it because their delusional confidence is the only thing holding their identity together. They don't know how to be wrong without changing their entire sense of who they are. And if being wrong is a skill and Dunning-Kruger affects that too, God help us. 
Whatever is going on here, the Dunning-Kruger effect is much more complicated than the way it shows up in popular discussion. One certainty we can take from the study is that everyone is wrong about how they stack up against everyone else most of the time. Cognitive biases affect everyone, and they're like trying to see your own face without a mirror. Maybe the answer is better mirrors. Maybe it's more mirrors. Maybe we need to figure out why some people are so afraid of mirrors. If I find more research on this, I'll be back to let you know. In the meantime, if you have the chance to give someone a glimpse of their own reflection, try to take it. More importantly, when someone takes the time to hold up a mirror for you, seize that opportunity and look. I'm excited to dig further into cognitive biases. They're terrifying, relevant, and there's so much we don't know about them. I do want to say a special thank you to MacArthur Wheeler, wherever he is, for committing an act so profoundly illogical that he made us look in the mirror as a species. That poor guy. I also want to greet the more than 500 of you who subscribed since our last episode came out. Welcome. I'm excited to have you, intimidated that you're here, grateful, all the things. And your feedback and support mean a lot to me. Thank you. If any of you out there have the ability and the desire to support the channel on Patreon, the link is in the description below. This time I've got a bonus video with a few extras from this episode, things like why I'm sure MacArthur Wheeler lived alone, and my take on explaining what's going on with hyper-competent people underestimating themselves. So head over there if you can. And as always, to my patrons, you know I love you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.